One of the best-selling toys of all time, most people know Teddy Ruxpin as an animatronic talking teddy bear who narrated children's stories for two amazing years in the 80s. But here's the thing, not only is he not a bear, but his origin actually traces all the way back to 1958 and his creator, Ken Forsey. Ken Forsey, born in 1936, worked as a production designer on two different pilot episodes of two different television shows in 1958. One, a puppet show called The Adventures of Sir Gadzooks, the second, a science fiction show called The Flying Dutchman. Neither pilot was purchased, but the experience taught Forsey a lot about making television shows and inspired him to do something different with puppets on television. It also introduced him to writer Norman Bud Bankson. In their conversations, Bankson wondered aloud what might have happened to monkey astronauts utilized during the early days of the space race. What kind of fantastic adventures could they have had? Forsey's television aspirations would have to wait until after he finished his service in the U.S. Army. Drafted in 1959, he served for three years before ending up at Disney as an Imagineer working on new Disneyland attractions like Jungle Cruise, It's a Small World, The Hall of Presidents, and The Tiki Room. Through the 1960s, as an Imagineer, he sculpted characters, designed creatures, and environments. He got first-hand experience of Disney's new audio animatronic technology that synchronized pre-recorded sound with programmed puppet movements. Forsey worked at Disney by day while taking on other theme park design and development jobs on the side. Between all that, Forsey, on his own, developed fully realized characters Simeon Greep, his friend Grubby, a scientist Newton Gimmick, villains Tweeg LB, and this mushroom-headed guy named Teddy Ruxpin. After Walt Disney's death in 1966, Forsey worked on the Haunted Mansion, which opened in 1969, and the Country Bear Jamboree, which opened in 1972. They were Forsey's last jobs for Disney, as he recognized that the new leadership wasn't going to run things the way Walt did. Thank you to KiwiCo for sponsoring this video. Go to KiwiCo.com slash SecretGalaxy to get 50% off your first month of KiwiCo today. The world is full of hollow, mindless activities designed to keep you and your kids busy scrolling through an infinite stream of content. KiwiCo delivers something else, entertainment that is exciting, educational, and fun. KiwiCo offers monthly crates featuring projects for kids as young as one month old to teens to 30-somethings, 40-somethings, and beyond. Designed by experts, everything you need for the project is included, from detailed assembly instructions to simple answers for all the hows and whys that each project will inspire. Every finished project is its own reward, a testament to the time spent and lessons learned. And, depending on the project, it's something that can actually be used in everyday life. Headphones, soap dispensers, decorations, and robots. All kinds of robots. KiwiGo ships to over 40 countries and offers nine subscription lines, each catering to different challenge levels and topics. And they make for a unique, creative gift for the kids in your life or for anyone who has kids in their life. So click the link in the description below now to get 50% off your first month by going to KiwiCo.com slash SecretGalaxy. Again, that's KiwiCo.com slash SecretGalaxy, and thanks again to KiwiCo. By 1975, he had already plotted out 39 episodes for a Simeon Greep series while witnessing a children's television renaissance that included new puppet productions like Jim Henson's Sesame Street in 1969 and The Muppet Show in 1976. In 1978, Forsey teamed up with Charlie Kowalski, Ron Burnett, and frequent collaborator Bob Anselmo to form Brown Squirrel Productions. Their intent was to raise enough investor money to produce a 10-minute proof of concept for Forsey's innovative new puppet television show, which was now going by the name The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin. Forsey wanted to create a show where all of the characters were puppets and the world they inhabited was fully realized. Forsey wanted to give characters more freedom to move, to express emotion, and for the children who watched to be more believable. Animatronic puppet heads, full body costumes, and immersive sets aren't cheap. Brown Squirrel pitched a 90-minute movie for around $500,000 or a full 16-episode season for about $1.5 million to networks, but no one was interested at that price. The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin was dead on arrival. A few years later, in 1981, Forsey's aspirations were bolstered by Chuck E. Cheese going public. Created by Atari co-founder Nolan Bushnell in 1977, Chuck E. Cheese helped popularize the use of animatronic puppets in restaurants, malls, and retail storefronts. Forsey worked on Sid and Marty Croft's Pizza Productions as it drafted on the animatronic pizza restaurant fad like so many other pizza joints that seemed to pop up overnight. It didn't last long. Market saturation meant a short life for most of Chucky's competitors. But the knowledge Forsey gained was invaluable. When pizza productions closed, Forsey bought one of the animatronic bear heads to take it apart and figure out how to make the audio animatronic technology smaller, wearable, and pre-programmable. 
The Disney Channel launched in 1981, and in 1982, Forsey won the job to create costumes for their live-action Winnie the Pooh series after demonstrating a fully articulated, animatronic Winnie the Pooh head he designed and built. With the Disney contract in hand, he started a new company called Alchemy 2 in his garage and recruited four other artists, Linda Pearson, Mary Becker, Leon Heflin, and Larry Larson. No relation. The Welcome to Pooh Corner costumes were essentially full-body puppets worn by actors paired with an external two-track tape deck. One track contained the character's audio, and the second track the pre-programmed mouth movements. The tracks were sent through a remote transmitter to the costume's head. The eyes, eyebrows, and ears were then controlled by the suit actor using switches wired into their gloves, a complex and unprecedented puppet performance. In 1983, another puppet show, Jim Henson's Fraggle Rock, began airing on HBO. Kids were plagued with puppet mania. Unrelated to that, also in 1983, the entire video game industry in the U.S. crashed due to an oversaturated and largely unregulated market, and as far as U.S. retailers were concerned, video games were dead. And that left a lot of people from the tech sector unemployed and looking for work. That said, by the end of 1984, in Japan, the Nintendo Famicom was the best-selling console with over 2.5 million units sold, and Nintendo was looking for a way to expand into the now toxic U.S. market. Believe it or not, this is important, and we'll come back to it. At the same time, Alchemy 2, the company Forsey started in 1982, had grown significantly. One of the last projects they completed for Disney was smaller, doll-sized versions of the Welcome to Pooh Corner characters to be used in the series. Forsey recognized that technology would allow for the previously external tape player to fit inside the smaller, doll-sized animatronic puppets. This was a perfect toy for Disney to produce and sell, animated talking dolls of their hugely popular characters. He budgeted out the cost for mass-producing the dolls, took it to Disney, and... They passed. Forsey and his team at Alchemy considered creating their own characters or potentially licensing other characters to utilize the technology. Better yet, Forsey was convinced that they should make an updated version of the classic teddy bear until fate intervened. Sadly, in August of 1984, Ken Forsey's wife Wendy passed away. Her death served as a reminder to Forsey of his own mortality and convinced him to prioritize the thing that he had spent so much time working on. Teddy Ruxpin, a lifelong side project, became THE project. Within a month, Forsey had a working prototype. Forsey's company, Alchemy 2, was low on funds and desperate for a corporate partner. Forsey took Teddy Ruxpin to Hasbro, who were interested but couldn't see a way to get it to shelves in less than three or four years. Alchemy 2 would be out of business before it shipped. Fortunately, Forsey connected with former Atari executive Don Kingsborough, who not only believed that Teddy could be produced in less time, but he wanted to buy the rights to do it himself. From the New York Times in December of 1985, as the video game fad passed, dozens of fun-loving Atari engineers had to find new jobs. That, as well as the general slump in electronics, has fueled the surge in toy design. In February of 1985, Kingsborough created a new company with several of those former Atari engineers and executives called Worlds of Wonder. Their explicit goal was to manufacture and sell Teddy Ruxpin and Teddy Ruxpin-related products. Kingsborough convinced investors that Teddy could clear $50 million in sales within a year, and he was right. Also, as if to spite Hasbro, Worlds of Wonder had Teddy Ruxpin on shelves in time for the 1985 holiday season and an incredibly short 10-month turnaround. To promote Teddy Ruxman, Alchemy 2 partnered with the ABC Network to finally bring Forsey's dream project to life, a live-action Teddy Ruxman special. It cost $1.5 million and was broken into two half-hour Saturday segments that aired November 30th and December 7th, 1985. The Adventures of Teddy Ruxman introduces Teddy Ruxman the Iliop, not bear, he's not a bear, and his octopede friend Grubby. The two friends embark on a magical journey in search of the treasure of Grundo. Along the way, they make new friends and face new challenges. What's an Iliop? According to Wikipedia, quote, Iliops are humanoid bear-like creatures with kind dispositions that reside in modern Rolonia after a forced mass exodus from ancient Grundo where they had an advanced civilization. They are not bears. ABC and Alchemy split the production cost, and while it was ultimately too expensive to produce as a continuing series, the investment in the live-action special paid off. It was a ratings hit that aired multiple times over the next few months, sold millions of copies on home video, and moved a lot of Teddy Ruxpin dolls. Worlds of Wonder did roughly $70 million in its first year with Teddy Ruxpin, even better than the Cabbage Patch Kids did in their first year in 1982. I failed again. How about these, Master? Hi there. My name is Teddy Ruxpin. How are you today? Fine. Well then, 
I would like to Teddy Ruxpin. The world's first animated storytelling bear. It's alive! Now available at stores everywhere. It's alive! Retailers sold out as soon as they got them in stock, driving up prices on the secondary market. Teddy Ruxpin was the best-selling toy of 1985. Take that, Hasbro, Disney, Star Wars, Masters of the Universe, Transformers, and G.I. Joe. By March of 1986, sales were roughly $100 million for Teddy Ruxpin-related products and also prompted lawsuits brought by Worlds of Wonder against copycats in an effort to control quality and protect their proprietary technology. Worlds of Wonder attempted to recreate Teddy's success with other licensed characters like Peanuts and Mickey Mouse, but neither had the same kind of success after so many other similar, less expensive options were available. Teddy Ruxpin made Worlds of Wonder into a retail sales juggernaut. They compounded that success with more success as Laser Tag raced to $300 million in sales in 1986, eliopping Teddy Ruxpin's sales. With two of the most popular toys on the market and a reputation for technological innovation, they were an ideal partner for U.S. distribution of Nintendo's redesigned Famicom, now called the Nintendo Entertainment System. Kingsboro and Worlds of Wonder were delighted with Laser Tag's performance. Who wouldn't have been? They leveraged the strength of Teddy Ruxpin and Laser Tag to coerce retailers to purchase the Nintendo Entertainment System, even if they thought video games were a dead market in the U.S. The only way to get to Teddy and the lasers is to buy some Marios. Forsey wasn't excited about laser tag. Teddy Ruxpin was born from his desire to do better for kids, to teach them to be good people, to care about the world and each other, to find value in friendship, honesty, and imagination, not solving conflict by tagging each other with lasers. By October of 1986, Worlds of Wonder was sitting on nearly a billion dollars worth of orders for Teddy Ruxpin and Laser Tag, while acting as the only distributor for the Nintendo Entertainment System in the U.S. Teddy Ruxpin was the top-selling toy of 1986 as well. Take that, Thundercats, Battle Beast, Muscle, Inhumanoids, Robotech, Bionic 6, Brave Star, and Sport Freaks. With a live-action television series already deemed too expensive, The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin continued on television, this time as an animated series in partnership with Deke Enterprises. The production was moved to Canada to take advantage of the cost savings. 65 episodes ran from December of 1986 through October of 1987. Forsey developed the Bible for the series himself, incorporating many of the characters and plots from the original storybooks and tapes that came with the toys. Other writers expanded the world to new places with new characters and conflicts. Phil Barron and Will Ryan, who voiced Teddy and Grubby since the beginning, were retained for the series. Unlike many cartoons of the time, The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin was a deliberate story with episodes that were not interchangeable in their sequence, characters and subplots developing over time. The success of the series and the toys made another dream come true for Forsey, as he was not only able to meet with Jim Henson, but to become business partners with him. Henson loved Teddy Ruxpin, might have even been a little jealous of it, and was more than happy to distribute the animated series to international markets through Henson Independent Properties. It also opened the door to development of a series of Muppet Babies dolls that would have used an even more advanced version of the Teddy Ruxpin technology. Shown off at Toy Fair 1987, prototypes of Kermit, Miss Piggy, Gonzo, Fozzie, and Ralph, if produced, would have interacted as a group through signals sent to them from the Magic Trunk. The full set of five animated dolls would have been cost prohibitive, but not completely out of the question, and it might have happened if not for the financial troubles that Worlds of Wonder found themselves in. Damn, we're in a tight spot. Damn! We're in a tight spot. Damn, we're in a tight spot. By October of 1987, the NES's sales were defying all expectations, and as a result, Nintendo ended their distribution deal with Worlds of Wonder in favor of handling it themselves. The video game market in the U.S. had changed significantly, and Nintendo of America was almost single-handedly responsible. Like Atari and Chuck E. Cheese before him, Teddy Ruxpin's success in such a short period of time fueled dozens of copycats and knockoffs that oversaturated the animated talking doll market. For Christmas of 1987, Worlds of Wonder grossly overestimated the demand for Teddy Ruxpin's. Even worse, Laser Tag suffered a public relations setback as a nationwide effort to ban guns as toys picked up after incidents of police shooting kids carrying what they thought were real guns. And on October 19, 1987, the stock market crashed, causing retailers all around the country to cancel their orders, leaving Worlds of Wonder with warehouses stocked floor to ceiling with laser guns and unmovable bears. Ow. Eliops. Worlds of Wonder stock went from $30 a share to less than $2 a share. With their businesses so closely connected, when Worlds of Wonder crashed, it almost took Alchemy 2 with it. Forsey, heartbroken, stepped aside and named a new company president who knew it was her job to lay off the hundreds of staff, liquidate the assets, and close down the company. But before Alchemy 2 closed the doors completely, there were signs of hope. In 1989, Worlds of Wonder filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. In a last-ditch effort to save the company, Worlds of Wonder introduced new core products exploiting the Teddy Ruxpin license. 
a line of baby teddy and grubby dolls, a movie projector, a phone, and other low-quality products, because Worlds of Wonder weren't what they used to be, and neither were Alchemy 2. That said, in 1990, Worlds of Wonder finally closed for good, allowing Alchemy to take back the Teddy Ruxpin license. And in 1991, Alchemy found a new partner in Hasbro who redesigned the doll to be smaller and incorporate cartridges instead of cassettes. After selling over 6 million units in two years with Worlds of Wonder, Hasbro sold roughly 500,000 in five years. Alchemy terminated the license in 1996 due to an unacceptably high failure rate in the finished dolls. Two years later in 1998, Alchemy and Teddy Ruxpin were back in business with Don Kingsborough and his new company, Yes Entertainment. Teddy got a makeover complete with a new shirt, new art, new interactivity, CD-ROMs, and even a more competitive price point. Alchemy withdrew the license shortly thereafter due to financial troubles that Yes was unable to reconcile. It marked the second time that Alchemy misread Kingsborough and Kingsborough misread the markets. Also, some people may have been doing crimes. After nearly a decade in hibernation, Teddy returned for a fourth time in 2005 to celebrate his 20th anniversary, this time with Backpack Toys who upgraded Teddy's tech to digital ROM cartridges. Ken Forsey was back as well, and Linda Pearson, one of his original partners in the earliest days of Alchemy, managed the overall production. One of Ken's goals was to develop a Teddy Ruxpin feature film. To bring the market up to speed, he facilitated the release of the entire series on DVD for the first time in 2008 and 2009. The movie would have served as a continuation of the original series, essentially episodes 66 through 70, but it was never produced. His health began to decline, and in 2014, Ken Forsey died at the age of 77. Three years later in 2017, Teddy Ruxpin was back again, this time from Wicked Cool Toys. New technology allowed Teddy to have a solid state drive with three stories installed on his hard drive right out of the box. You can download additional stories through the app. In 2018, Alchemy and the Jim Henson Company entered a development deal to produce a new Teddy Ruxpin animated series. It would have been a compliment in style and tone to their 2018 reboot of Muppet Babies, but it was never produced. And in September of 2021, DJ2 Entertainment, a company whose website is broken and hasn't tweeted or posted on Instagram since 2022, announced that they had secured the rights to develop a Teddy Ruxpin movie and potentially an animated series. According to DJ2 Entertainment founder and CEO Dimitri Johnson, he'd been trying to acquire the rights for nearly seven years as the stories had captivated his imagination as a child. DJ2 has been, quote, Hollywood's premier production company known for adaptations of video game IP into film and TV, with the 2022 Sonic the Hedgehog movie being their biggest success. Their Netflix series Tomb Raider The Legend of Lara Croft starring Haley Atwell is set to be released sometime this year in 2024. If all goes according to plan, Lara could pave the way for a future filled with Teddy Ruxpins. Teddy Ruxpin was a technological marvel during a time of technological marvels. He was a wholesome hero with a world full of friends and adventures that taught real lessons about life and morality. Beyond the incredible innovations introduced to the toy market, Teddy Ruxman exists today as another victim of the constant recycling of legacy brands from the 80s. That said, many of the children who loved him then still love him today, a testament to Forsey's desire to make a real positive change in the world through his creations. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free, as well as behind the scenes features, sneak peeks at upcoming projects, and exclusive monthly podcasts about the show, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toy galaxy. Thank you very much to Billy Tuma and all the people at Grundo Gazette for the Ken Forsey Come Dream With Me Tonight documentary series available here on YouTube. It's nine hours of comprehensively researched information straight from the people who brought Teddy Ruxpin to live. It was an invaluable resource in the creation of this video, and I encourage everyone to go check it out. It is a far deeper and more nuanced story than even we expected. Ken Forsey brought so much magic into the world, and the documentary has preserved that story for future generations. To be clear, he is a bear, even though he is not a bear. He's an alien. Cut. <laughs>